you on the ice this weekend? Uh, not this weekend. Today I was on the ice. Today I was just telling Justin I had uh, 2016's first, uh, our first meet ever. 2016. Yeah, 2016 Czech Knights. We were on the ice. I had 26 players and five goalies today from all over Czech Republic. It was wow. actually quite amazing with this high, the high quality of skills these guys have. It's it was mind blowing. How do you how how does a, a player uh, at that age get on the ice with you today? Like, are you hand picking them? Are they signing up? What does that look so, like? Oh, so what I do is in each like age group, I have a couple guys in charge that I trust, like that are working with the age group. So and then we work on coach recommendations. So what we do is we will get together like for the Czech nights. We will have a tw- anywhere from 24 to 30 kids for the meet. We don't want more than 30. Usually we want 30 because uh, we have an hour of uh, skill sessions. So we will, do, uh, we will do all kinds of skills, skating, stick handling, puck protection, battles one-on-one. And the second hour, we play full ice scrimmage, which is 50, which, which we have today. Then you have three lines on each end. And you can play a game if you have 30 kids. So how it works is uh, coaches recommendation and people that I know or guys that I observe throughout because I coach, uh, I go to games from the little guys all the way to the to the U17s to, to the pro games. But with the Czech Knights, well, I scout, scout, I scout all around um, the Czech Republic, even outside Germany, uh, Slovakia, Poland. And we'll get 30 guys together and we'll try them out. And if we uh, like them, we continue with them and then we rotate them in. So we have a base, about 40, 50 players that we work with throughout the year. And we try to meet. At in one least age group or in multiple age groups? No, in multiple age groups. Got it. So Got it. I have about 40 to 50 players in 2016, 2015, 2014, uh, 13, 12, and all the way to 2009s. Because then 2008s are already the national teams, is the U16. I see. I see. Wow. And so, I mean, you just subscribed sort of what a, a practice in January, which I guess is sort of an evaluation practice. In general, once a player is, is a member of the Czech Knights program, in a given practice, how much of the focus is on individual skill development? How much of it is on, say, team tactics? How do you sort of break down really, the, the development? It criteria? really depends what part of the it what it really depends what part of the season it is, right? So right now, what we like to do is from September till December, uh, we're running more of like skill basis stuff, and yeah. we're have all all meets are more skilled based, more like a development uh, games. Like you have small area games, so we can observe the guys, we can teach him through different individual skills. And then December, we try to pick our teams for the upcoming season because our main season with the Czech Knights is starts on April and goes all the way to end of July, right? Got so it. that's when we have our tournament. So we try to pick in December, we pick the teams. And then in January, we'll still have our meet, but st- starting uh, February, not the 2016s that we had today, but starting February, we'll start more team tactics. Because we want to get them prepared for the tournaments, we want to know what they want, so they can they know what what our strategy is in coming into the games. What we want them to play for, but for Quebec, for our team that's going to Quebec, it's a little bit different because we want to be ready for the tournament that's in February. So uh, we get our team set uh, in early September, and starting f- first th- I think October, we're already we're already meeting just with the team, and we're focusing on team stuff. What we want to do uh, come come to the tournament because we see these guys once a month, every month before we go for a tournament. So, for example, for Quebec, you see them five times, and you have five five two hour practices to teach them to be a team. <laughs> So, you know, it, it's funny you mentioned the Quebec tournament. So I, I've shared this with you. I coached a team uh, when I was the hockey director yeah. at North Carolina <laughs> Winter Club. And we played you guys in the, uh, it was the quarterfinals or semi. I believe. Yeah, it was. Yeah, 2020. It was the quarterfinals or semifinals. We played you guys. But of course, yeah, you know, yeah. you're at that tournament and you're, you're going out and you're kind of watching the other uh, top teams. 
And I remember watching you guys play in advance of that. And, you know, you're trying to pull out some tendencies and, and like the tendencies that I pulled out were just, this team is unbelievably creative. Like if we try and, if we try and counter them zigging, then they're going to come out and they're going to zag. Like these are just talented <laughs> kids. So anyways, we had a, we lost two, one to you in that game, yeah, heartbreaker. <laughs> and uh, you had a, you had a great team, but I went back and found the gold medal game on YouTube and I've, and yeah. I broke it down and I've used those clips in so many coaching presentations to illustrate that, you know, here's this, these, you know, group of really talented kids playing other really talented kids. And I said, and I, I'll, so I, what I would do is I would show a clip of say, you know, a minute long clip of, of your team playing in the defensive zone or offensive zone. And I'll ask the coaches or whoever I'm speaking with, they'll say, Hey, pull out the, the team system and, you know, they'll take their notes, but then we'll end up rewatching it. I'm like, there's really not a system so much as like all the success. It's just, you could, you can identify. It's like this kid, you know, breaks the puck out on his own because he's got really great acceleration with his feet or, you know, this player you can see instead of curling low, recognize there was space. So they, you know, they took a different route on the breakout and they found space. And my point was that I just think it's a great illustration where if you equip kids with, with a, you give them a good toolbox, the game kind of, they figure it out for themselves. Like the game works out, you know, like, and is that, is that a fair assessment of maybe how you've approached building the program? Yes. Yes. So like how we basically, we teach the kids, the only two tactics we really teach them is the D zone. We try to teach them how to play box plus one. Yeah. That's the only thing. Yeah. And then only the second other thing we really focus on is always having F3. Because these, when, well, yeah, when coming it. to North America, when coming to North, that's the only two things. When coming to North America, uh, you, you know, the teams are so, if you, ca if you get caught on a fast break on man rush, 90% of the time it's a goal. It's just American and Canadian hockey. They know how to score two on ones, three on ones. It's a goal. They know how to capitalize. So that's the only two things we make sure they learn or they're focused on is having F3 and how to play in the D zone. But other than that, we let them be creative. You know, it's, uh, you don't want to tie them down. We know why they're there. We don't build any pressure on them. Hey, we're here to win the tournament. Not at all. We all are starting to get, when we get on the plane, when we have our first meet uh, before uh, getting on the plane, we always tell the kids, guys, just enjoy the tournament. This is probably the most fun tournament you'll ever play at and at, at your uh, youth hockey career. So just have fun. Don't put any pressure on yourself that you need to win. No, either it's going to happen or not, but they need to be creative. And we really want them to show off the skill set they have. Because you have different kind of, uh, as you mentioned, we have you have different kinds of talents. You got guys that are super fast that can just use their speed to get it out of the zone. Then you guys, then you have guys that can slow down the game and they see the ice well. So it's just a matter of complementing the guys, putting them together so they complement their game. But we let them play. We let them play and be creative, showcase their skills because they're great hockey players. That's. Uh, if we tie them down and with any like offensive offensive uh, skill set or system, it's it's just uh, not having them through the year. You would have them. That's the one thing that I would say uh, that's also a big advantage for the American and Canadian uh, teams. There is they have the players for the full season, right? They have yeah. uh, five six months to prepare. We have them. We meet five times before the tournament because they are in their we're a development team, so we work with them throughout the year, but they're, they're, ha they're each playing for their own respective winter team. Yes. So for Quebec, for Quebec, we were a development team. We worked them, we work them as I mentioned, we started at early age, seven, uh, seven, seven, eight years old. We work, we start working with the guys, but we only see them. What if I count the tournaments and I count the practices, maybe we see them five to 10 times a year. So we have uh, then obviously individual practices and all this stuff. But as a team, we see them about eight, I would say eight to 12 times. If I don't, if I count each tournament pre, as one. Pre-tournament in Quebec. Yeah, yeah. No, pre-Quebec, pre-Quebec, you saw pre-Quebec, we see them 
uh, October, November, December, uh, January. For, yeah, five times. Pre Quebec, we see them five times. We have them as a group on the ice. We have these wow. mini camps, you know, that we work with. So you really, the only things that we stressed on, it's D zone and F3. <laughs> Other than that, you let them be creative and you got to just mix and match the guys when uh, you put in the team together. So you know that you have a guy that's going to defend for you. You got a guy that's going to forecheck for you. You got a guy that's going to score. You got a guy that makes, that's going to make the plays. So it's just mixing the, getting the right group of guys. And the most important thing for us when picking the team is the team chemistry. We want our kids that are going to be together as a pact, not individuals. And most of the, that's, that's all our success is that these guys come there and they know that the team is bigger than themselves. You know, no one is bigger than the team and they buy in that they want to, they want to be successful and they will, they will, they will, some guys want to be more on the puck. But they will sacrifice that for the team's success, you know. So it's uh, okay. It's so really I'm, I'm asking on behalf of um, the entire youth hockey community because <laughs> generally, um, when you've got a, a talented players, especially a group of talented players, normally, and, and you know, yeah. like I know for us, it was a big expense for our families to go to Quebec. I'm sure it's a big expense for your families as well. Um, You know, you factor in talent, you know, money, time, et cetera. That usually means high expectations. Maybe it's generally it's harder to get that buy-in and not make it about the individual because everybody wants their child to be successful and be showcased. How do you, how do you set your program up for success in that respect? Cause again, it's, it's easy to say that it's another thing to have a culture where that actually gets adopted. I think, you know, I think, uh, primary, primarily it's, uh, that we have been successful at these tournaments. Yeah. You know, if I count the last, so if without COVID and obviously, unfortunately this year we are part of the team rotation that we're not able to go this year. Yeah. Uh, we're, we have been invited for next year, but this year team rotation, they told us this year we cannot come. We respect that. So excuse me. So we respect that. But if you factor that out of the eight years that we have been going there, uh, six times we were in the finals and three times we were the champions. So I think it really the people see that it's not as you mentioned it's really it's it's a finance by the parents right no one is getting paid for the parents are financing financing it so it's expensive it's expensive but i think that when the people see the level of the play of these players and see the success that it's really about picking the talented guys they buy into it they buy into it they when i make when we make the for example, I had the first meet today with the 2016s. The first thing the parents say after the practice is we cannot believe the talent that was on the ice. So for us, it's very important that when we start introducing the players and the parents to the program, that we introduce them into a program that's really working with talented guys. So we're not just, we just, it's not that people just call us, Hey, we want to be a part of the Czech Knights. Yeah. Uh, no, it has to be, we watch them, we scout them, we get coaches recommend the players and we really want the top guys to work with. So it keeps the quality, uh, because unfortunately in, uh, here you don't have the triple A, double A programs in, uh, in Europe, you have only one level of hockey. So this is basically your triple A. You're working with these guys. You get the top guys on the ice together and the parents uh, realize, okay, it's a total different level from the club and they buy into it and they, they want to be, they, they want to, they want to have more. They, they want to practice more. They want to see each other more. They want to go to a tournament. Yeah. Iron, iron sharpens iron. Yeah. I'll give you an example. It was what I was really fascinated and really pleased about. I'm going with the 2014s uh, to the Hockey Hall of Fame tournament in Toronto. Yeah. We had our meet in uh, January, uh, second week of January. We had our like tryout for the Toronto, already just invite tryout out of the 30 guys that we picked from the meets that we had. I I had uh, 
seven, I had two goalies and 15 players that I picked for that tournament. And only three guys said no. You know, and Got it's it. expensive yeah. for the families. So I had 13 guys, uh, or 14 guys, sorry, including the goalies, buy in and, hey, we want to come. So I'm, I'm now I'm happy because I'll be bringing a great team. But the parents see that the uh, program has been suspect, successful and they see the kind of players that went through the program and they want to be a part of it and they know it's maybe the way to develop because they see the we make the we make the any tournament we go to it's not just about hockey it's all about the culture right we want them to ex- experience um uh, uh the different con- cultures in toronto like so for example canada us they get a feeling it's not hockey only based it's also experience we want them to become great people and uh, also as hockey players. So they, they really buy into it in that way as well. That's, um, that's really interesting. And, you know, you, just going back to your comment about letting the kids play and showcase their talents, how do you think it would affect the product or how they perform on the ice if the message to them was, hey, we're going over here and we better win. And, you know, if you're not performing, you're going to get sat on the bench. Like if you change the narrative to that and put a lot of pressure on these kids, how do you think that would affect their creativity? And just I their think, you know, if we, if we were, I think our country specific or our uh, society specific, uh, we were affected by the communism, right? There was communist, communist here. So back in the day when we had the golden era here in Czech Republic, when it was Jager, Straka, Špáče, Kabrle, it would have worked on them because uh, they wanted to do everything in their possible power to be to go away from the country or to have healthy family. But within this culture that we're living in today, it would not work. It would tie the hands of the kids. It would stress them out and they would not be able to perform. I believe I be, I believe that the mentality of the kids that are growing up now is they need to have more freedom and they need to experience that the coach is standing behind them and kind of gives them a free uh free um how would I say it? uh there is a, basically the coach is not tying them down you know they're giving it, it, he's, he's giving them freedom to perform to be themselves to exp, to uh to play how they want the game because if if i was standing there and i or any coach i believe in this era and would say okay we need to win guys this is the only thing hey put the the guys would uh not perform that well under the pressure because uh the mentality is just is just different now you're going there you're more relaxed you know you're no one is putting pressure on you you're you're more relaxed obviously you see a guy making the same same mistake th- three times in the game you're gonna tell him hey listen buddy this is probably try something else this is not gonna work yeah. but you cannot sure. time out you it's they perform if you if you i did it when i started coaching you know when i started coaching these guys i tried not to win unnecessary but i was like okay let's do it this way let's do it this way you could see the guys were trying too much, but to do it the way, like say say you draw up a play for them, there was no creativity, right? It's literally yeah. how you draw the play. They would try to perform it that way, but then you gave them creativity and all of a sudden you gave them freedom and you saw them making the play as you want it, but they added one or two things or skills to it and it was boom, it worked. So, I mean, you're Adam and you're a young guy young coach. And yeah. I, and I, I'll tell you what, if, if we stopped the interview after you said, the only thing we teach them is how to play box plus one in the D zone and have F three, um, in, in the offensive zone. And other than that, it's up to them. Like if we stopped the interview there, this interview has been awesome. Like that, I think that's so great for everybody, including myself to hear. Um, but where do you think you gain that confidence to step back and say, Hey, I'm not going to drop every single play. I'm going to trust these kids to go out there and, and do their thing. And I, you know, I might provide some feedback, but I'm, I'm not going to get in their way. You know, I, I was fortunate enough 
uh, since young age. So I had a good child. I can only thank my father for this, okay? Because I had an unbelievable childhood. Uh, I will run you through it real quick. So yeah, when I was uh, when I was ten years old, my dad sent me to Germany to a pilot family to live in a to live. I had, I did not know one single world in German. Not one Which single. Which town world. in Germany was it with a club or? Uh, uh, it was a club. It was I actually I was living in Beratshausen with yeah. one of my uh, now great friends. Uh, they took me in because we met at the select not check nights, but a different select uh, sure, event yeah. that I was playing in. So it was the Patochka family, and they were so kind to um, tell my father, "I, you want to send your son there? You can go." So my dad, you know, he took the uh, he took the opportunity, and he sent me to Germany when I was 10, 10 years old by myself. And uh, I did not know one single word in German. The family spoke Czech, so that helped me. But first thing they told me when I got to the house, no speaking Czech. So I was like, great. <laughs> they gave me one week, one week to uh, kind of get uh, uh, settled in. And then they for they were like, they were spoon feeding me, you know, I had to I had to learn. And I did. And that was a huge experience to me. When I was 13, then I came back. When I was 13, my dad sent me to Florida. Same thing. My English was so-so. He sent me to Florida by myself. Lived in a billet family there. Played AAA hockey at, in Florida Everblades. Yeah. In Fort Myers. Yeah. And, uh, you know, another great opportunity by myself. But how I said, I can only thank my father for this. It's I have a daughter now, and I cannot imagine sending my daughter this young somewhere by herself uh to uh play hockey but my dad didn't do it only to play hockey he did it so i learned the language and for the experience you know it would make me who i am today and then i moved to the states when i was 16 that was already with my father but i was fortunate through my uh through my either through my hockey career through school and now through my coaching career i was fortunate to meet very interesting people and i am a sponge as a person, I'm a sponge. I love to absorb new information and I'm very really open to talk to people for hours and hours about their mentality. I share my mentality and like I I don't count myself that I'm perfect. I want to be perfect, but I like to learn. I don't put myself above anybody. I am the same at same level as everybody else and I want to learn from them because I believe that from every person in the world, you can learn something. You can learn good things, bad things, but it's just up to you to filter that out. But you can learn from everybody. So where I really, where I really uh, get the get the uh, sorry, uh, get the f- f- not focus. Shoot, uh, sorry, I, I forgot the word. Get the confidence. There you go. Get yeah, the confidence in these players. There you go. Uh, the confidence in these guys where uh, I can step back and say, okay, guys, uh, do your do yourself. Uh, it's from my father. He told me, he because he has experience of coaching a lot of guys, and he told me, sometimes when you're working with these guys, it's better to let them work yourself. And of course, sometimes you need to time down a little bit, talk to them, calm them down, but let them be creative. And I coach at... Quebec, obviously, that's the biggest tournament, but I coached at WSIs. I won it back to back. Hopefully, this year I'm going for knock on the teeth. I'm going for the have a good team coming there. So, with the tents, so it's going to be maybe a triple. But uh, it's, I believe in the guys and I believe um, they trust in me. So, when I tell them something, because I take a friendly approach with these guys, I'm not the guy that's going to be there and you cannot talk to me about anything. No, they take me as one of their own. And it's maybe because I'm young. They can, they kind of look up to me. They take me as a friend, you know, and, but they know the line, they know the boundary line and I'm friendly with them. I try to give them a lot of energy, but then when it's time, like when we, uh, when, for example, in Quebec, we were down t- uh, to nothing in the, this year in the semifinal game. <laughs> and, uh, we're there in the between first and second period. And I see the guys, they're like all like shaking. And I tell them, look at me. And I was literally laughing on the bench. 
I tell them, hey, guys, we're 2 nothing down. And I will, I guarantee you, this is the easiest game we played at this tournament. It's 2 nothing. We have two periods uh, left. And they're dumping the puck on us. They, they were scared to play. They're dumping the puck from the red line. They were scared to do something. I was like, hey, guys, just believe in yourself. Play, play, do yourself, play you, and it will happen. And then all of a sudden, we got a goal, and it, it kind of got there. But as you said, the confidence come. It comes from my life experience, and it really comes from the players. The players yeah. give me the confidence, and I really believe in the guys and they believe in me, so it's kind of like a great relationship, and that's where I get the confidence. It's like, hey, when we when we get down to uh, different uh, scenarios, sometimes they're difficult, sometimes they're easy. They will they will perform. So it's interesting you mentioned like a team that you're competing against is dumping the puck on you, and 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 you're you interpret that as that hey they're they're scared, like they're just playing a safe game. Do you think like, and again, I, I say this, like the Czech Knights, it's a pretty remarkable collection of talent. I don't think that's, that represents, you know, for everybody that's coaching youth hockey that listens to this, I don't think they're fortunate to maybe deal with that level of talent. However, would you say from a developmental standpoint that encouraging kids to do things like dump the puck in or to not use their skills, even if they're not like world-class skills, is maybe too safe of a way to coach and or maybe a better way to ask the question is do you think that as a youth coach we should always be encouraging kids to make plays with the puck even if that means they're not successful all the time but at least go back to that because that's how we're going to develop players i think i think for youth coaches in general my belief is that uh yes of course our i want to win Okay, I will tell you this. I want to win. I hate to lose. Yeah. But we're working with young athletes. We're working with guys that have their whole entire careers in front of them. It's not, I, in, in my belief, it's, it's not important when now and here. It's important for them to win and get to the next level. And for them being able to get to the next level, they need to try these plays. They need to, when else they're going to try it? They're going to, tr- how you want the guy to perform and do, I don't know, a toe drag or a mohawk or get, you see all these highlight plays. You watch McDavid, you watch, you watch Kale Makar, you watch Nikita Kucherov or uh, Connor Bedard. You think that if in the, youth uh hockey the coach would tell them all the time to dump the puck because he wanted to want the uh, win the puck they would be making these highlight plays no i don't believe so i believe that, yeah i believe they need to be creative it's the it's if they're not by the it's our job as youth coaches for the kid even if you start obviously you, the kids the you the kids rotate you coach different levels but it's important for us to let them be creative because by the time if if they're fortunate enough to make pros they need to have that stuff automatic they need to believe in themselves then ha- they yeah. have to have that confidence totally. and where else to learn it than in the youth games in even if it's even if it's a world class tournament like pv quebec if it's wsis it's you competing against the world talent and if you're not able to do it at the youth level how do you want to do it at the pro level and you need them to give them the confidence. Obviously, if you see a guy, for example, I have a, uh, I've coached many great players, you know, and uh, I was fortunate enough. If you see a kid that has amazing skills and he's going every single time he's going on the ice and he's going between, try to go between three players. If he does it four or five times and he's not su- successful, you tell him, okay, try you not you don't yell at him and tell him that's wrong. No, you try to explain him. Try to do it a little bit different. Try, but you need them to let them figure it out themselves, so they believe in themselves. That's I think that's the biggest biggest thing about being a good hockey player. It's you have to be confident in yourself. All the, you have to be confident to pull pull uh, away uh, the great moves and the hard opportunities and the uh, great tournaments that are coming up like my just just uh one thing that i'll say my family has been in hockey over 100 years yeah my uh, i played hockey my brothers play my dad played my grandpa played my great grandpa played 
I have my uncles played, my cousins, like big hockey family, you know. And every my grandpa comes and watch hockey with me every every week at least twice. We watch the Czech Pro League no or way. when it was World Junior. Yeah. And we're watching the World Juniors and we're just looking at like team team Finland, for example. They're down. They're down. Uh who were who were they playing? I think it was it was Canada or US. I or Sweden. I don't I don't know. It was it was a semifinal game. It was a semifinal game uh this year. I think it was against uh, US, I believe, because yeah. we lost to we lost to Sweden, so it was against US. And Canada got upset. It was a semi- yeah, yeah, it, yeah. We upset Canada, and then we were playing. Uh, then we were playing US, but Finland was playing. Uh, no, we were playing Sweden. Finland was playing US. Yes. So Finland was playing US. They were f- playing the without the goalie, right? And you see a guy, a defenseman. He gets all of a sudden he somehow fumbles the puck or gets a bad pass on the blue line. A guy is right on him. You think he shoots the puck in the corner? No, he escapes from it. I was I was blown away. I was like in a U20 World Championship and the guy's that confident with a game on the line and he makes a move one on one. I was like, "Okay, how does he do it, right?" Because he did did it a million times in youth hockey, and the coach probably didn't tell him, "Hey, just dump the puck in the corner." No, he let him do it, and that's I I believe that's the way that these young guys, these young athletes, needs to be coached. They need to learn from their mistakes, and they need to be getting the freedom to try these things. Because if they don't try it, they're never gonna learn. Yeah, you know what? Um, do you know Tobias Johansson? Does that name ring a bell? Yeah, yes, yeah, that's something. Yeah. Yeah, so he's he used to be the head of player development for Forlunda, and he's the head of the Norwegian national yeah. team now. But yeah, I remember chatting with him, and he was saying like, "Yeah, he's like they do drills like working on beating players at the blue line." He's like, "And I know that's generally like the rule is like black and white is you never try and beat a player one on one at the blue line." But then he looked at it and said, "Well, if everybody else is saying don't do it, and we can coach our players up so they can do it, or they have the confidence to do it." Well, that's how you change the game. That's how you get a really competitive advantage. And again, just so like so simple, but when you hear it framed that way, it makes so much sense. And, um, you know, would it be fair to say, Adam, that especially when you're coaching young kids, you know, avoiding having rules or black and white scenarios saying in this situation, you always do this or you never do that. And just saying, hey, like there's so many different scenarios in hockey. Let's just you know, react to each one individually and educate kids versus giving them, there's a difference between, I guess, educating kids, giving them solutions versus saying right or wrong type of scenarios. hundred percent. I I totally agree on that. Like if I I do, I do video with my guys, right? I, for example, my brother is a 2010, he's a defenseman. Yeah. And uh, I would, I would get so upset with him when, uh, I see him in the defensive zone or even the offensive zone. Yeah. Just take the puck in the defensive zone and just shoot it off the boards. I tell him that is the last thing you want to do. You know, you don't want to give him black, black and uh, white, but that is the last thing you want to do is give away the puck. You want to try something. And when I do video with guys, I always, I never tell them this is the wrong, wrong play or right play. What I tell them is I let them rewatch and I let them think what different plays they see. If we, you can get open, if you can make a pass, if you can shoot, if you can escape. And I let them decide what is the best option here without just telling them, okay, you, gotta, you need to do this and this and this. No, they need to, they need to uh, get those things in their head that it has to be from their own mind. Because if we just tell them what to do, we're taking away their hockey sense. We're taking away their hockey IQ. They need to learn for themselves. So they gain, they gain the high hockey IQ. They know how to act in those situations and how to react. So um, we do a study just trying to keep tabs on where hockey players come from. So this year we looked at eight regions um, and, and looked at it in terms of per capita you know, how many NHL players are being produced. So you, know, you can see Sweden um, is is working at a one out of every 653 kids approximately are 
um, playing the National Hockey League. Uh, Finland's got a pretty good ratio. Uh, the state of Minnesota is is the best in North America relative to the U.S. and in Canada. But then you see um, Chechia, and they're number two Czechia. per our calculations in the world. And my sense is is that Chechia kind of had a rise where they were producing a lot yeah. of players and it kind of dipped a little bit. But now in recent years, I mean, you go to the, you know, two great back-to-back showings at the, at the U20 World Championships. Um, we're seeing more players being drafted again, like early high-end picks. What would you say has happened in the last 10 years? Because obviously if there's, if we're seeing success now at the U20 level, that would signal that there was changes or progress being made probably eight to 10 years ago. What do you think's changed over that time that's led to Chechia kind of getting back to one of the elite talent developers in the world? Uh, I think uh, a lot of things, I wouldn't say necessary changed. I think just people started to get a different idea of hockey. They started really, we started really like going out of the country, seeing what's being done everywhere else. Not meaning that we would try to bring it back into our hockey, but we were, we were just looking at how what the competitiveness is is, right so like how would we would compete against canada how we would compete against us finland and sweden and i think we now give the players as i mentioned more freedom and more coaches understand that uh the development of the players is more important than winning at youth youth hockey uh, in youth hockey and we let them develop and we give them opportunities we give them the skills uh, the skills uh, sets we have more skills coaches now uh that are working with the players i think more players started really believing in that it's not only about team practices and they also go to different skills coaches to get better at different at different uh skill sets you know even skating stick handling shooting whatever whatever the skills are but uh i think it's more now uh there is more now uh working with uh skills as well as learn teaching them uh some tactics at the at a later age and that that has helps a lot and the clubs have been really uh putting uh their hand down so they have the good coaches in the youth levels so the players grow and uh lastly i would also say and not take any anything away from the clubs the clubs yeah. have been doing great great job because as i told you like we see the players very and you work for uh, a club as well yourself to be fair yeah i work for pills and wolves yeah yeah i work i will for pills and wolves so i know the at the club level they really put their hand down and the clubs are really good working with the kids they're trying to develop players and try they're trying to now we have uh they're giving opportunity to youth guys to play at pro levels you know we we are seeing this this uh year we seeing more and more 16 year olds uh, playing for the pro hockey here, pro for pro teams in the highest league. Interesting, you know, and it's also great to see that almost uh, I think there was like five or six 2007s that played in uh, the Czech extra league, and all of them were from the Czech Knights. So which was uh, which was great to see. Wow, no kidding. <laughs> but yeah, we had uh, it's 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 great, but. I'm not saying that the Czech Knights, it's the reason why the hockey is uh, going up. But I would say that definitely that's also a good big thing because we gave these guys uh, opportunity to see the level outside of the Czech Republic. We gave them the experience at the big tournaments like Quebec, the World Selects Invitationals. And if, uh, we used to go to Russia for uh, good tournaments in Russia, like Pro Rift Cup. And uh, I think that helped a lot. So last year, I think it was eight guys. This year was nine guys on the World Junior team from the Czech Knights. At the now we were just silver at the uh, uh, Olympics, all right? The Youth Olympics. We were we had a lot of guys there from Czech Knights as well. So, but I think that also the kids going through these, if, either if it's us, my majority, because we we go to the top events, but there is also different selects. I think that helps a lot with the players because they go outside the country and they see and they get the experience uh, that it's just not about Czech Republic. You know, it's the hockey world is so big 
And when you start working, when you sleep, someone else is working somewhere else trying to get better. So <laughs> you always got to work. But it's actually the federation. They have been a huge help as well. They've been trying to develop coaches, give them the tools so they can uh, give it to the young players, the youths. And that's helped a lot. They give all these difference. We had NHL uh, synonyms here, uh, speak, speakers, so the uh, coaches can apply, go see and yeah. live NHL coaches. That helps a lot. They have all different speakers from different countries that will go in and give different uh, different presentations that all these coaches are available to go to or they will even do it online so, they, so more coaches can join. So it's, I have to say the Federation have given a lot of uh, coaches great tools to work with the guys and the coaches want to work and want to get the players better. Uh, starting with the clubs, that's the biggest thing because the club double of the players and it's more and more coaches are really giving them the time to learn and to study so they can give it to the guys. Got it. <clears throat> Man, those, those st- statistics are pretty incredible um just in terms of you know from that many kids to come from one obviously part-time program but still part-time yeah development uh, program well, development yeah program. <laughs> Let, let's go back to the ice time you think you, you said you just had so if my math is correct you were working with eight-year-olds is that right yes so 2016 so for 2016 so they were seven eight right because uh yeah. plus eight is 24 uh so yeah seven eight-year-olds so when you're working with kids that young, and I know you you listed some of the things that you worked on, but what would you say like at at, at say at, at that age, those the first couple of years that players are in your program, what are you t- focusing on? Like if you were to narrow it down to two or three things to say hey, in the first couple of years, we really focus on these areas, but then we shift to maybe so a couple I other would areas. Say of focus. The first biggest thing is the kids need to have fun, right? Yeah. Because How do you make it fun? I make it, we make competitions. We make different competitions. Is there skating competitions, stick handling competitions, smaller games competitions? We'll make it fun for the kids. Because when you want to have, at this, at this age, you want the kids to come to the practice and they want to be there. Oh yeah, we're on the ice. It's so fun. We want to come back. So that's very important for us. And focus-wise, we focus on skating. That's the biggest thing. We focus on skating, edge work, skating, like really edge edges, inside, outside edge. Uh, Can I ask and, you a question on that? Yeah. When you're working with young kids and you're working on skating, do you introduce the puck right away or do you start without pucks and then add it later? What does that progression look we like? We start without pucks. So if I run you for today's sessions, we had like 15 minutes of uh, the first, first 15 minutes of the session of the hour first hour session was just skating right so we did some one foot glides two foot glides make sure they have the correct uh, hockey position uh then we go into some light edges inside outside edges and then some warm-up drills some speed races to incorporate in them to make it fun for them then we separate them into uh, two groups where we actually three groups one groups plays games and two groups have, we call it a T practice. So basically, if you uh, imagine the rink, you have two long skill sessions all the way from the goal line to the blue line. And then the blue like, line. To cut the in the middle. So you have two cut sets. In, yeah, cut in the middle. Cut in the but, middle. Yeah. And at the blue line, you cut it. So it's like a T, right? It's like this. So yeah. blue line to goal line, there's a game. And from blue line all the way, the long, the long red line, second blue line, all the way to goal line. So the long T is the skill zones. Okay, got it. And in the skill zones, we work on uh, stick handling, but really puck control. You know, you want to teach them how to really correctly uh, use the forehand, the bag hand, and you want them to focus on really like just just taking, taking it slow. It's not about speed, but always with a finish. We always have a goalie there. So they go through some, uh, let's say... Um, how, how would you uh, describe it? It's um, uh, it's it's easy to say in Czech, but English I I don't know the word. No, that's okay. <laughs> so you mean like so? There's a there's a goal or 
kind of a, at the end? Is that what you mean? No, like just yeah, to... always, always. So it's like, so the first progression of the drill, it's, uh, it's just a skating, some different obstacles, right? You go, you have a couple pucks, you go through the pucks using really back and forehand. Then you have a long, long reach. So using the bottom hand, learn to use the bottom hand, move it on the stick. And then you go around some stick. And then on the way back, you turn and then you skate, you linear class over with the puck. So again, you're covering with the forehand, covering with the backhand with a finish and you're back in the line. And then the second one, it's pr- pretty much the same. So we work, we really work on stick handling skills and skating skills. That's the biggest two, that's the biggest two areas that we work on with, with these guys. And then it's mostly games, different races with the puck, without the puck and small area games. Uh, when you're talking about puck skills, so we yes. start, you know, so I, I love how you broke that down, you know, you know, top hand, bottom hand, starting slow, adding speed. When does passing become part of the, the equation? When you introduce so passing, maybe think, focusing so on passing. I think first and foremost, they need to know how to handle the puck, right? So they need to even, it's hard, it's hard to explain. So, uh, if I'm working with the kids at the Czech Knights level, right? So it's basically the top kids from the country. The level is different than if I'm just take, if I take, because I also coached 2016 at the club. So from my club, there was two guys that were there today at the Czech Knights. And then you have 16 guys that are not there. And the difference between those guys is pretty, it's pretty big, right? Because the top two guys are somewhere here and the rest of the club is maybe somewhere here. So when you're working with the when you're working with the Czech Knights guys, it's a little bit more advanced. So you can we already did some passing today as well. They were uh, one of the drills on the other side what they were doing, they were doing inside edges. They were doing inside and outside edges. And then they got a pass from the coach. They passed it back uh opened up opened up for a pass they the coach gave it to him they made a move and went to to shoot on the net so the passing is incorporated but for me uh when i when i run my practices with uh this young guy seven and eight year olds not specifically check nights but seven and eight year olds i like to do station work because it's for them it's i do skating to warm up but they should do really do skation work and i already start at this age I really do start working with passing, but we work on stationary passing. So we have a smaller group of guys, you know, we have six coaches on the ice. So each coach is, has a, each a skill breakdown. So I have a station for skating. I have a station for passing. I have a station for shooting, stick handling. And then always I have, if I have six stations out of those six stations, I all have, I always incorporate two games. Uh, so, uh, they have, they have skills, skills, game, skills, skills, game. So they have always something to, uh, look forward to because I don't want to just drill them, drill, 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 drill. You want them to have fun, right? That's as I mentioned. So, but breaking these skills down with seven and eight year olds, I really start with stationary stuff. If it's not skating and stick like easy stick handling with the puck while skating, passing, I do stationary, so they really first we teach them obviously side to side how to uh, receive a puck, how to uh, how to receive it, how to pass it. Then you teach them how to face each other and receive the puck facing the player and pa- pass it facing the player. Then you start with backhand to forehand, you know, and it's you you work but you each step that you work with is you got to be they have to be confident in the first level to move up to the second second level because if you, if they're not if they don't know how to pass side to side which is the easiest easiest pass because they don't have to they're they're not able to put the hands in front of you like this they usually it's easier for them to do side to side they cannot do front to front so it's really for me when i work with kids it's important that they learn each step by step and we don't skip over steps. You don't want to try to uh, go make too difficult for the kids. You're trying to do it so they're confident in the first step for them to move to the second one. W- would it be fair to summarize that as you rather, for lack of a better term, we rather 
overcook them, meaning like build lots of confidence and get them really good at a, a basic skill, then try and accelerate them through it where maybe they might get through it, but they might not have that sort of confidence. Exactly. To, to pull the oh, that's, out that's, and that's, that's completely correct. That's completely correct. You said it, you hit it on point. It's just easier. For, it's, it's hard to, sometimes it's hard to make it, uh, the, these small words overcooked, but yeah, no, no, hundred percent. You don't, you don't want to rush them. You know, you don't want to rush them. You want to develop them steadily because, uh, as, as, as soon as you want to rush them, they will, th- they will build bad from my experience they'll build bad habits because you rush them so they will start doing something to make it easier for them for themselves but maybe it's not the correct way and then it's harder to break away the bad habit than learning a new one you know if you have a bad habit it's hard to get rid of it than just learning something from scratch yeah that makes sense Talk to me about the games you play. Like, do you play, like when you talk about practice, do you just play like cross ice three on three or do you have maybe some some favorite games that you play, particularly with kids that you found have been really engaging? You know, I play, uh, there is a many of games. I like to change it up for the games and I like to yeah. make the games so they have to be creative and they have, they have to think about it, right? So of course, sometimes you just play cross ice three on three, but that's just hockey, right? So, for example, today, one of my, uh, it's one of my favorite things to do with the kids. So just so you make them think is you play cross ice three on three, but you make out of cones, you make like these nets, like side by side cones that they have to skate through. And for them to be able to score, they have to skate uh, through this gate made from these cones. All else they cannot score. Before they get to the net. Before they get to the gate, they have to skate through one of these. I make like four. If you play in cross ice, I make four different gates from cones. Yeah. And for them to score, they have to go through one of the gates. Do you so put them like the, in, in the middle of the ice or where do you position them? No, I different. I put one in the corner. I put one in the middle ah. of the ice. I put one uh, by the boards, one behind the net. I, I make two, four to six gates. But it's fun to see how the guys get creative right because at first when you give it to them what happens is they want to get to the first one that's the quickest way for them but the the guy the even at this age the little guys are really smart so they see a guy yeah. coming through the gate so they will stand in the gate and all of a sudden the gate is closed and you cannot get scored so then yeah. you start seeing them and it's amazing. It's uh, even at this level, seven, eight, you will start seeing a guy coming to the gate and then he cuts back. So the forward, yeah. so the forward, and then he cuts back and you see him to start being creative. And as soon as they master, master just skating to the gates, I will add to it and I will say, okay, now guys, you can either skate through it or you can pass through the gate to your teammate. Either, either of it counts. And then again, yeah. you were working on a, not, you were working from escapes. Now you're working on uh, you're working on playmaking skills. Yeah, 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 love it. Or another game I like to play with them. It's a fun one too. It's I take the heavy heavy puck, which is orange. Okay. Yeah. I take, the, I take the blue puck, which is like the light light version for the little kids, and I take yeah. the black puck. And each puck has the meaning. So let's say okay. blue puck, you score on your own net. Black puck, you play regular hockey. You skate. You uh, you would shoot on the op- opponent's net. And orange puck, you can skate. You can uh, score on both. And now the kids have Could to. Could you put all three pucks and play at the same time? No. So. They, let's say they're oh, playing wait, three so on three. They go in and they get score. a puck and they got to figure it they out. They get a puck. They get a puck. They score. I throw a different color in and they have to react ah. to it. So they have to, they always have to react. So it's, see, it's super cool to see them being creative, you know, uh, you know, it's, uh, and they have to think about it. All of a sudden they take a blue puck, which uh, you're supposed to score on your own net. And they go all the way to the different net and they score on the different net. It's like, you just scored an own goal. And it takes a couple tries for them to realize it, but you make them think. You make them think. You make them think about different scenarios. They're, they're not just playing the game. They have to use their brain. And last one I will say, which is also a very fun one, 
and there is a lot of collisions first time you play it, but it's super fun. It's we play two on two into a cross. It's actually I saw I got it from a co coach that saw it uh, at a uh, at floorball, and it's actually super. So we will put the nets. It's almost full ice. You put them in each circle of the dots. Uh, so and you play cross ice. So one team has a net on uh, in one circle and cross ice the other circle in the D zone. Like if you imagine uh, one is in the offensive zone, one is in the defensive zone, right? Inside the circle. And they're playing across, two on two. But at the same time, there is another clue, group that's playing two on two this way. So there is, let's say you're playing two on two and there is eight players playing at the same time. So, so there's two two on two games diagonal going on at the same time, exactly. But it's in within one one zone. Is that right? Being played no, within no, no, the blue no. line. It's it's uh, I don't I don't have a board here, but yeah. okay. Imagine the full rink, right? Yeah, full and rink. You yeah, have four four circles: defensive zone, offensive zone. Yeah, got it. And they're playing almost full ice across from each other. So when they when you when you dump the puck when when you when first first thing you set it up you put two, two pucks on the red line there is four lines on each blue line is a line let's say we have orange and black right so yeah. there is two black teams on one blue line one cor- one side of the blue line second side second side of the blue line there's two orange teams yeah and the orange team have the they have the nets here the black teams have it here, but they're playing across from, if you look across from the blue line, that's the team that you're playing against. And for them to start, they have to go behind the net and take the puck that's in play, that's on the red line. But after the first whistle, that it's that's on the red line, they always have to watch where the puck is because there's two pucks in the game, but only one puck is for your group. So you and go you in and color pucks again, or they just have to watch no, the pucks and like keep track. Like they have to watch the play. It's simulating you're on the bench, you're on the bench, and you, you're just not like doodling around. You're looking where the yeah. uh, puck is. So when you jump yeah, the, yeah, yeah. to the game, you know where the puck is. So now you have two games going on at the same time. So you have to, you have to know who you're playing against. You have to know what net you're going on, and you also have to watch the other game that's going on. So. First time you played, oh, there is a lot of collisions because you know what happens? The kids sometimes head down skating like this and all of a sudden a kid that's playing across head like this, boom. <laughs> so it's teaching them to have the head up and to see like yeah, yeah, totally. to watch the to watch what's happening on the ice at all time. But it's a super fun game and super it's actually very useful for them to get the head up and uh move the puck and watch the game. It's Super, it's super fun for them. They love it. That's great. That's great. I, you know what? We might have to get you to scribble some of these down just because I, I know what's going to happen as soon as this gets released. We're going to get a ton of DMs on Twitter <laughs> asking <laughs> to steal your drills. Uh, so no, I want to get into the PSA. I, I, I don't, I don't uh, like that word, steal my drills. I love to share my drills. You know, one of the things I will tell you, one of the things that I hate. I absolutely hate it. When a coach goes to my practice and watches a practice, watches a drill and then does it himself. I hate it. And I, and and I will explain you the reason why. Because when I'm working with these guys and I'm working with these, I'm not saying I'm the best coach ever, but we're working on a def. I were working on a specific skill. And maybe when you do the drill yourself, you're working on a different skill, right? That's okay. That's fine as well. But I am not a close person. I love to share my, share my things. And when I see a coach doing a good drill on the ice, I I stop him after the practice and I'll ask him, hey, what is the purpose of the drill? Why you were doing it? Because if you just take the drill without knowing what is it about, maybe... You, yes, you add some of your key components to it. You make it yourself, but it's always we. You have to develop as a coach, right? As you were a player, you had to develop. You had to learn. So it's cool to talk to the coaches and tell you, "Hey, this is why I'm working." And maybe while he comes to me and asks me why I was doing it, he'll give me an idea that I can 
add to it that I could work with within this drill. And it's cool to share. I just don't like, I, I don't, I wouldn't say hate it. I just don't like when I don't call it stealing, but when you just watch the drill, come and ask me why I will, I'm, I am more than happy to you use my drill. It's a, for me, it's huh, you take in my drill, you take in my drill. It's huh, okay. Maybe I'm doing something right, but take the purpose as well. That's it's we're coaches. We should be learning from each other. I had a, uh, I will a little bit jump away from this, but I had a really good friend that's a coach in Finland. He was a goalie coach. And I really love what they're doing in Finland. In Finland, they every month, all the clubs send their coaches and they get to together and they talk about what they're working in the club. They share all the ideas of all the development they're working at each club. And they share it all together and they do it so Finland hockey gets better. And I coach kids, so kids kids get better. I don't coach kids, so uh, for my uh, like, okay, I want to be the best. No, I coach it first for the guys. So I love to share. I love I love guys. I love other coaches coming to me. I love going to other coaches, and I love like for example, I love watching the coach uh, side presentation because the guys that present there is amazing, and it's amazing to see the presentation and then explaining and going through the drill. It's yeah, better totally. than just going on it's better than just going on Instagram or YouTube and just watching some player do a drill. Oh, that's cool. But no, but here in the coaches side, what's so great about the site, it's I love it. I absolutely love it. I've been a subscriber for three for like three, I think three years now. I love watching the other coaches explain to players why why they're doing the drill, what to yeah. look for. What, and it's it makes me better as a coach, and I can make the players better. Yeah, I I agree with you, and I, I think that's I always use the analogy like if you go on YouTube, I'm sure I've repeated this, or I'm, I'm repeating myself, but um, and I've probably mentioned this on the podcast, but it's like if you go on YouTube, you can see a Michelin star chef make a meal, and he does it right in front of you, like you can go copy it but it doesn't make you a Michelin star chef. Like there's exactly. things that they're doing that doesn't show up in the video where they've got to explain the, how they got there or the why behind it. And I think that that's, you know, it's so important to ask questions. And I agree with you. Like, you know, we work um, with the Finnish Federation as well. And, and it's, I think the one thing that they've done there is that when you talk about those youth coaches that are getting together and sharing ideas, when you go talk to them individually, like when they, when they watch their, their national team play, whether it's at the U20 world championships or the Olympics or world men's world championships, they all feel like they're a part of it. Like they all feel like they played a role, even if they didn't coach a specific player, like they feel like they're all a part of, um, you know, that national team and feeding into it, which is, I think that, and that's, again, sounds really easy, but I think that's tough to do, but to have that sort of a culture is so impressive. Yeah, um, Adam, we mentioned you're, you're speaking at the, the GSS or the global skills showcase coming up in March. What are you going to be presenting on? I'm going to be presenting on uh, puck protection, body positioning, and using a defender's energy to your advantage. Can you specifically touch on using a defender's energy to your advantage? So as I, I, I will, I will uh, touch on that. But first, I don't want to. The be... video is going to be really important in this podcast. Like, if you're not watching the, the video here, you might miss a lot of this, which is great. <laughs> I will, I will um, say where at first I got the idea from because I don't want to steal anybody's work or not give uh, anybody uh, the um, uh, credit recognition credit they deserve. So, one of my best friends has actually that's this is how I got into being a skills coach. One of my best friend is working was working or is still working with Adam Oates. You know, he's he's the hockey whisperer. He's been working with one of these great players. And um, a lot of the stuff that he works on is just making the guys better and less vulnerable to uh exposing them into the wrong areas and wrong hits and ex- as well as using players energy. And I watched some of the practices through my best friend because he was there. I was watching the practice. And it's amazing. That's how I got the idea. And really uh, using a, the, what it's about, the using uh, defender's energy, 
is being able and learning while, while protecting a puck and the guy is right on your hip or right in your back pocket using that energy of either if it's of the push or if it's him trying to get around you using that to your advantage so using it's physics right so you have an object pushing you from pushing you from behind you don't really need to be skating away from it you can absorb the push into sure. into escape or into uh making a play whatever it is escape or skating forward cutting more in front of them you using the guys uh force to gain energy yourself yeah. so it's it's helping you to escape as i mentioned it's helping you to cut in front it's helping you to skate it's helping you to and you're saving energy for yourself you don't really have to be skating <laughs> while while he's pushing you in any, any kind of direction yeah you, you know we we first got turned on to this so again i'm in vancouver and um when the Sedins first came over, twins, yeah. there was this sense that, you know, a lot of the commentary was, you know, that they were soft or they didn't work that hard. Um, and they, and they kind of played this peripheral game. And then I think what people started to, and if I think if I'm being honest, I think for a lot of us, especially in North America, we just hadn't seen hockey being played that way. We certainly didn't coach our kids, but it was just how they would go into a corner and they, there might be, you know, a 10 foot gap between them and the nearest defender. And they would just stand there and wait for that defender to catch up. And then they'd make a play. And it was just so subtle. Like you could see where people would be like, Oh, they're not really trying hard. But then over time, like, actually, no, they're playing chess and everybody else is playing checkers because <laughs> now when they, they could get that puck and turn or, or cut back, but they're going to cut back right into the defender and expose the puck. So they just wait till they get on their backside. Then they cut back. Now they're stepping into open space and, so I think it's, um, yeah, I, I think what you're talking about there is really, I mean, the NHL All-Star game just happened. And like that, what you just described there was on full display where these players where, you know, they're not necessarily going at 100 miles per hour. They're probably thinking at 100 miles per hour, but they're just able to manipulate defenders with the puck. And um, yeah, it's, this is, we're really excited. I think I think it's I think it's very important skills, and I think it's under how you said it's I think it's underestimated because uh, it's I like your analogy there. Uh, everybody's playing uh, checkers, and they were playing chess. Um, I think a lot of times uh, we are uh, we are taught that if you're a defender, you dictate the play, but at the end of the day, it's the guy that's on the puck if he knows how to use it. He's dictating yes. the defender. Yeah, you know, and uh, if you're a if you're able, if you're being taught at the young age, if you're being taught that if you're on the puck, you gotta. It's not that you're making the defender go where you want him. It's uh, uh, sorry that I I uh, said that wrong. You're making the defender go where you want him. Right. Yeah. So, yeah. for example, you let him come to you. You let him think that he has you where where he needs to have you. You let him angle him. You, why not? Yeah. You let him. But then you use the energy of him angling you, being in the back pocket, and you give him just a little bit push, just make him think you're going inside, and that's where he thinks he got you, and he's gonna start pushing against you, and you just make a cutback. All of a sudden, he blows by you, and you have all the time in the world. To make a play and it's uh being you're dictating the diff when you're on the puck and you if as, as i mentioned you gotta teach the kids it's just and it's a level some guys have it some guys understand it and the faster you learn the faster and the the more you can use it but on the puck you really dictate in the guy you can and the closer the closer you have him to you i feel like the easier it is to escape because when you have a, when the guy has a gap control, he has his stick ready for you. You have to make a move through his stick. You have to go around him. There is a gap. It's easier to to catch you. But when you when he's tight on you, when he's right on you, and you have him in your back pocket, you have him side to side. Your shoulders are touching. Just one move, and quick feet, 
and you make a huge separation. And that's hard, and that's hard to uh, come back from that. It's if the guy's gapped on you, you're going one on one, he's you're he's he has the correct gap, it's hard to get by him. These guys, today's game, defensemen have great, great skill set. They know how to use the stick. They know you, you, they know how to use their body. But when you have him side by side and you learn how to push him or manipulate him where you want him and use his energy to your advantage, to get by him, to escape from him, to let him push you first, you're saving a lot of energy. Uh, I know in the presentation, one of the things that I talk about is uh, keeping the guy in the back pocket. So really what it is, it's imagine the back pocket of your jeans, you putting the foot in front of the defender and the guy is right on your hip and yeah. him just trying to get around around you and you're keeping the leg in the pos position in front of him and he's pushing you. You're, you don't have to, you're just transferring weight maybe a little bit but there is no effort at all and you're skating on the ice. And uh, from that from that position, it's so easy first to make a pass because you, you always can cover the puck with the leg, with the hand, or with the body. Or you can make escape. You can push the guy, feeling, making him feel you're going one way, escape the other way. Or, either, either, or you can just skate away. It's, it's hard to take a puck from the forward if he knows how to puck protect it and if he knows how to use the use the defender's energy and realizing that having him next to you is not necessarily a bad thing. Yeah, and I think that's so. I want to ask one last question because before we let you go, because I work. Everybody loves the show. I, I coach my little guy. He's in U seven. <laughs> and I think that, man, it's really tough with kids, right? But you, you, I can see it. Young kids are, I don't know if they're taught, but it's certainly instinctual. It's like, if I have the puck and somebody comes near me, I should get rid of it. Yeah. Right? Like, that's the habit. It's like, I get the puck, let's just slap it away because that's uncomfortable. And, and so I, I think about, I'm like, how do you, how do you build confidence? So we try and get our kids, it's like, hey, every time you touch the puck, take two strides then make a decision. But we, we're trying to build that habit in them right now. So my question to you is, is when do you start introducing these skills? So we talked about those first few years. When do you start introducing these skills to players, roughly? I would say I started these, I would say about U9, U10, is okay. I start working with these guys, but just slowly, just puck protection, just different kind of games, just realizing that uh either either one of the guy one of the things i uh do in the presentation keep away in the circle you can already start with yeah. that at uh either a younger age but at an older age i would say around nine ten years i would say 10 years old to be exact 10 years old to be exact you can really start even uh explained into them that uh, you don't really have to, in a keep away, you don't really have to skate away and try to always go through the guy. And you can really yeah. use your body to move around your circle and to protect the puck. But I will say one thing, back to your uh, U, uh, U7 kid there. Uh, yeah. I have a really good game for that, for not okay. throwing away the puck. Okay. It's, you remember at the beginning when we we're talking about some of the games that I play? Yeah. I played the gate game with two on two with the guys, the yeah. gate. Uh, we don't play with any nets. It's just a keep away game. But so they just get I points for going through the gates. Going through the gates. Two on Got two. It. And okay. I make, interesting, yeah. And I make one important adjustment to it. The only way you can get the rid of the puck on your stick is to make a pass. Got it. You are not, but it's not a blind pass. Get rid of the pass. I, when a, when a kid throws the puck away from the stick or makes a blind pass, I explain to him, no, that's not a pass. It has to be, you look, you're making an eye contact with the guy and you're making a pass. Other than that, and it's teaching two things. It's teaching having the puck on the stick and just skating around and being confident. And you get each gate you skate through, you get a point. So you see the guys, oh, now all of a sudden they want to skate through, the, they, they're changing directions, they want to skate through different gates, 
and even the smarter ones, they'll straight to the gate, stop. And Do you ever play a one-on-one on one or two-on-two two works best? You can you can one-on-one, on one, you can play, or you can play two-on-two. Two. I you can I start with one-on-ones just yeah. so uh, just it's so happening. they're on the puck as much as possible. But then I go two-on-twos as well, so they have the option to make uh, the pass because if they're playing one-on-one, on one, it's easy for them. It's easy for you to say, okay, don't throw the puck away. You don't have the puck to throw the puck yeah, away yeah. to anybody, right? You're playing one-on-one. On one. So that's why I add the second player. But I learned from playing this game, it actually helps a lot for the kids not to throw uh, the puck away. And I also right. learned that most of the time they throw the puck away. It's not because they they're, don't want to make a play. Some of them are scared that they will get hit. Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. They're scared to get hit. And I think that's a big thing. Uh, we could talk another hour about that. But I think, and I, I introduce it to my kids very young. I'm not saying frontal checks at all. But I think it's very important to teach the little kids from the start. And I even do it myself is playing shoulder on shoulder and knowing how to react when you get a shoulder and shoulder check and how to give it. Because I go to the kids, I push them. Sometimes they're standing in the line. I'll push them just to see if they have the stability. And uh, they're scared to get hit. But when you explain to them, you know, it's, when you put the when you position your yourself in a way that you'll get hit and it doesn't hurt to get hit and you'll just use the energy of the guy it's actually you're teaching the u7 kids with to use the energy of the defender without them even thinking about it and uh it, it works it's actually does wonders when they're not when uh when you play that game because i learned from just from that game is how in, I played it for a month straight. Every practice, we play it at one of the stations. The yeah. improvement of the kids not throwing the puck away was amazing. Unreal! Wow, I love that. Man. It's it's it was it's great. It's a great drill. I it's a great tool. Adam, I uh, I got a ton of notes, man. This is great. Thank you so much for joining <laughs> us. I know it's late over there. Oh, no, um, it's okay. We let you go, talk, how how can people talk, find you? Hey, where can people find you (laughs) online if they want to reach out and learn more? Okay, so you guys can find me on Instagram. Uh, Joe Neck Adam. You probably have a a thing that up there. Or you can reach out through my email. That's any uh, any, any way. Or on the uh, uh, sports-connect.eu, our website where we have our cams, where we have the check nights. Anybody can reach out to to us there as well. Awesome, man. Well, listen, hey, again, really appreciate your time. Can't wait to see your presentation Bro, you nice. coming up in March. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's been, uh, thanks for, again, being an open book and just sharing this yeah. last hour. Thank you. Awesome. I hope you can use some of this. <laughs> thank you, guys. Yeah, thank for you sure. for your time. It was great. Thank you for giving me this opportunity.